today I'm joined by frequent guests, uh, the Goat and Julia. <laughs> Welcome to my show. Uh, Hello, thank, thank you. you for having me. So we plug ourselves now, or um, where people can find us, or I will let you know when it's appropriate for you to <laughs> okay, plug your stuff. Okay. Okay. Uh, before we start this episode, uh, I would just like to say that this episode is sponsored by our patrons over on patreon.com for Sans Asher Scapegoat. Thank you very much. And if you too would like to sponsor us, you know what to do. Indeed. So thank you especially to Jedi Davian, Michael Rook, Emil Segerbeck, Quagram, Inga Leonora, Shrijith, and Gecko Bite, as well as our cool patrons, uh, Nien Changmin, Emlem, and our big boy patrons, Joshua Cheeseman, e Joe Manchukuo, Michael Compton, and As Koala as possible. Thank all of you. Thanks. Thank Thanks you very lot. much. If you keep donating, uh, I will think up ideas of for t shirt designs because I think that would be really funny. We yeah. probably won't ever make t-shirts, but I'll think of <laughs> ideas for t-shirts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you keep sponsoring us, we can cut our ties with um, ExxonMobil, so that'd be exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can, uh, we can uh, stop uh, getting money from uh, for-profit persons. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Um, okay, so this episode, we're finally going to be done with the Democratic candidates for president. Yay. So we're going to be talking about uh, Cory Booker, Elizabeth Warren, Joe Biden, and Bernie Sanders. Yeah. You know him. Everyone's Sanders, man. favorite. Yes. Cory yes. Booker, our favorite. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't we all love Cory Booker? Don't we just want we to do. endorse him right now, the shit island seal of approval? I think we did a long time ago yeah. when he made that I have a dream speech. <laughs> yeah, the sh for anyone wondering what a shit I sort of approval is, it's literally just a turd being flown in your face. People mm. have been complaining that we don't do enough research, so here's a bit of research. Did you know that Cory Booker wrote the MLK speech, I have a dream? Mm. <laughs> I'll take be. that comment that section. Uh, yeah. Cory Booker was born in 1920. Yep. He's an AI created by aliens when they crashed in Area 51. That is true. Mm -hmm. That's what, when people finally storm that place, that's what they'll find. Just Cory Booker, just all clones <laughs> of like Cory Booker, which have all failed somehow. And Cory Booker's like one of the few that worked. And the other one is Carrie yeah. Booker. Yeah, the, on the only person who escaped out of the clone ex cloning experiments are Carrie Booker, his actual brother, who you are now free to download and be freaked out by how much it looks like a failed <laughs> cloning experiment of Cory Booker. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, just I guess to segue into Cory Booker as the presidential candidate, he is the former mayor of Newark, New Jersey, which, if you're not familiar with Newark, New Jersey, is the most populous city in New Jersey. Uh, he's now the senator from New Jersey, uh, where, which he transitioned into from being the mayor. His time as the mayor was pretty terrible or like poorly managed, at least economically. It was so poorly managed that uh, the city received emergency aid in 2011-2012. The murder rate was through the roof. He, the unemployment rate, he lied about in interviews and... Um, said that it was only a 2% when it turned out that he just wasn't counting people who didn't receive welfare, which he had gutted as, again, a PR move to get into the Senate. In terms of who he is now, he is sort of this virtue-signaling social liberal who uh, is the, you know, the beneficiary of a lot of Wall Street money, in fact, more than any other member of the elected houses. He gets a lot of money from real estate people, tech people, pro-Israel people. Big Pharma loves Cory Booker. He has voted against the bill, along with just a handful of people, to uh, lower prices of uh, pharmaceutical drugs. Because, again, he gets a lot of money from Big Pharma. He does a lot of, you know, very lovey-dovey speeches at uh, APAC, which is the pro-Israel lobby. He goes to those meetings and talks a lot about how great they are. And then when he's out on the campaign trail, talks about how they should stop being mean to Palestinians. He's kind of this snaky social liberal. Mm. He has voted for tougher sanctions against Iran. He has sponsored a lot of bipartisan legislation, which has been terrible. He has, but then on the other hand, he's also tried to, again, the virtue signaling, tried to pass legislation to ceremoniously limit Trump's executive power. 
So he's just kind of a slimy uh, uh, guy who tries to evoke Obama in all of his stuff, but really is just mm. like terribly democratic establishment. Yeah. Yep. That's about all I have to say about Cory Booker. Don't vote for Cory Booker because he's a terrible person who will screw over people and then claim he's doing a great job. Yeah, and to quote Mike Ravel, if you want to imagine a future under Cory Booker, imagine a boot stamp on a human face forever, and occasionally the boot stops to give you an inspirational speech about why you should never stop dreaming. Also, we're not covering Mike Ravel because he's irrelevant. And he's for the bonus episode. Oh yeah, maybe bonus episode. That's if, a bit if, of a spoiler. If you want to know if he is in the bonus episode, become a patron become and a you'll patron. find out. <laughs> <laughs> and then maybe you will see it, or not. Maybe not. We'll see. <laughs> Depends on if we have the energy. Yeah, because. All right. Let's, um, move, let's on move on to, to someone Warren. who's more interesting. Elizabeth Warren, the Massachusetts senator, who is all right. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, no, she's, she's got a decent record, um, but she's, she's like a, yeah, very much a solid social democrat with some usual social democratic tendencies which are bad but you know if you're if you're a social democrat this is your candidate he's a great social democrat if you think bernie sanders is just a little bit too far to the left then this is your candidate it's elizabeth warren that's that's the one for you so um yeah let's go through like some of her proposals i guess she wants to uh decriminalize uh, undocumented uh, immigration as a civil law violation rather than a criminal law violation which was mm-hmm. uh, raised in the debates, I've heard. She also wants to make it easier to become uh, a citizen, like removing some of the just stupid restrictions uh, on becoming a citizen, such as possibly having to leave the country for three or even ten years, uh, along with providing uh, more assistance uh, to immigrants uh, to help them integrate into uh, American society, such as English classes, civics lessons, uh, job training, that kind of stuff. Um, and also, um, because uh, she also wants to end the, like, mass prosecutions of uh, immigrants, which is tied into uh, the whole for-profit prison system and for-profit detention centers, which is uh, actually a really good system because we get paid by these people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we'd like to uh, thank our new sponsor, um, Institutional Corrections for America Corporation, mm. Limited Liability. If you're a massive multi-billion dollar corporation <laughs> and you want to sponsor us... Yes, if you are currently now. running one of these detention centers along the border and you want some good pr- publicity, give us an email. <laughs> yeah. We but, can definitely but, sway all of our fans to be for, oh, for yeah. perfect prisoners. Oh, yeah. They'll believe anything we say, don't worry. That's true. They worship us as gods. <laughs> oh, yes, they do. Um, let's see. What else has uh, she done? She's um, very critical of... Uh, the ways Wall Street like sucks money out of the economy rather than being a benefit to the economy, as certain Democrats seem to believe. Looking mm-hmm. at you here, Clintons. Yeah, she has like some regulations, like the Twenty First Century Glass Steagall Act, which would uh, break up uh, these banks from uh, into commercial banks and investment banks, so it's a lot less risky. Uh, if anyone unfamiliar, the commercial banks just like deal with like your savings accounts and whatnot and the investment banks what well, they deal with well, investing uh, as the name would imply and uh, she also set up the consumer financial protection bureau which has since uh, its inception in 2010 uh, returns i don't know how many uh, billions of dollars like billions b billions of dollars back to consumers uh, through refunds and uh, debt cancellations which is pretty impressive i'd say um yeah what what else? Um, any thoughts so far? Actually, I guess yeah. She uh, she reminds me of a populist social democrat. She has a lot of speak of talking points that are very populist. Uh, in that she comments on and offers up these classical European social democratic solutions to these uniquely American problems. Uh, and uh, that's that's interesting to me. She also kind of appeals to older voters in that Bernie way, where she most of her proposals come from a place of remember when we were kids, when we were kids, people were able to get into college and also afford 
dairy products, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah vote sales older than Bernie's uh, vote. It's now like 60% of my over 45, uh, which is the reverse in Bernie's case, where 6% are under 45. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, no, she does have uh, a certain audience, uh, which is quite distinct from Bernie's uh, audience. But uh, yeah. yeah, she's yeah that old school social democrat, which was actually kind of social democratic, um, with all yeah. the problems that came with it, which we'll delve into a bit later. Uh, yeah, but I don't think she's that good at like, communicating. Uh, her IDs, to be honest. Mm. She's more of a bureaucrat. Yeah, which I appreciate as a fellow bureaucrat, but uh, I, I wouldn't want to be the <laughs> spokesperson for my bureaucratic IDs. Mm. I, I'm not a good spokesperson for anything, and neither is she, to be honest. Yeah. I guess this would be a good time to talk about this idea that... Uh, uh, or or the, the concept that one of the biggest talked about points in this election among the quote-unquote left-wing Democrats is free college. Ah, yes. Mm -hmm. Let's quickly set the stage of a college planner. Free college education and massive student debt cancellation. Uh, depending on how much money you make, it, uh, it goes down a bit, but for those making... Oh, hang on, what was it again? Oh, yeah, for households making under uh, 100,000... Hundred thousand dollars a year, they get I think all their debt cancelled, and from that it then decreases until uh, two hundred fifty thousand uh, a year, where you don't get any more debt cancellation. Mm. I call that discrimination. <laughs> yeah, discriminating against the rich. But in terms of what back cancel uh, three quarters of the student debt in the uh, U.S. As Kanye West said, "Gotta keep them separated." I call that apartheid. <laughs> Yes, this is apartheid against the rich, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, you want to talk about education. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It's just, it's interesting to me that the people who are running on the left wing kind of separate themselves from the centrist Democrats in it that they also talk about all these socially progressive ideas such as um, more rights to minorities and people in the LGBTQ plus category. But the main other talking point that they have is people going to college, which speaks to their demographic, I guess, but also to this wider ranging uh, problem of education being very expensive. But I remember back when, because I'm old, I remember when Tony Blair uh, instituted tuition at universities in the UK and sold it as this idea of it actually being for the working class people, because the people who would be funding these highly expensive and were f uh, funding the highly expensive tuitions in the UK and who would also be funding it in the US uh, would be doing it um, from a place where, you know, they have to pay it over their taxes, even though they don't make that much money as is. So it would be sort of they sold it as, as a fairness tuition mm -hmm. because it because education is so expensive in the UK and the US. And I actually think they've got a they've got kind of a point in that, but but not in in the solution, but in the problem that education yeah. is so expensive for people who go to these elite colleges that uh, it wouldn't be a long term solution to simply institute uh, some sort of tax sponsored uh, solution to it. It the the solution, as far as I see it, would be to kind of break down why are these places so expensive to go to? What are they doing to keep the prices that high? And how can you kind of equalize the cost of, t of you know, going to an educational facility? Uh, it's not fair that it's so much more expensive to go to Harvard than it is to go to a professional school in some community college in Ohio. And I think if they did institute a program where, you, where college was paid for by taxpayers, it would be a colossal failure because it would be so expensive to uphold these Ivy League schools uh, entirely based off of the government's um, programs. Mm. Yeah, Harvard is fucking... The way I've heard Harvard described is like a trust fund with a university attached rather than a university which has a trust fund. Uh, mm. Place yeah. is expensive. Yeah. We have a, a similar school in Denmark, now that I think about it, called the Copenhagen Business School, which is... 
crazy expensive compared to all the other universities and they do everything they can to make it as expensive as possible including limiting the amount of students that can get in making it extremely hard for students to get in in terms of average grade scores and applications uh, so the result is that the students at that school are much more valuable in terms of government subsidies than uh, university students who go to the other universities in Denmark and that kind mm -hmm. of scheme where they end up getting a lot more money without having to do as much work. That's the type of stuff that needs to go away if you want a long-term solution to uh, people being able to get the education they want uh, yeah. for free or through some kind of um, social uh, construct. And the <clears throat> solution that some Democrats are proposing, which is that college should only be free for most Americans, but not uh, the children of rich people, the um, problem with that is that it gives the parents immense power to decide over their children's future because they can at any time decide to withdraw uh, paying for the tuition because children usually don't have their own money and especially not that much money. Rather, they have to rely on the money that their family has. And if their family decides whether or not they go to college, they can say, for example... You have to go to business school or law school. You're not allowed to get a liberal arts degree because we won't pay for that. And it also attacks the principle of universality of social pro uh, programs, which yes. means that um, if you only institute social programs for people who are uh, of, of lower economic standing, then rich people are going to hate it. And rich people have more power, so they're going to want to demolish it. Yep. Mm. Very true. It has to benefit everyone if you're going to do social democratic reforms or else the reforms are going to go away or they're going to get demonized or attacked from the right in such a way that it will be demolished quickly again. Which is why mm. we would now like to endorse officially the Yang Gang and universal basic income. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm joking, I'm joking. Before anyone gets the wrong idea here, we're, we're not fans of the Yang Gang. I guess no. like a hot take from me would say that I think the UBI is more thought through than the college proposals of most Democrats. Hmm. Yeah. That's an interesting take. Not that it's a better idea. No, no, no. But it's more thought through idea. in terms of longevity. Yeah, I guess. In my opinion. I don't know if it's specifically been thought through. I feel like it's just an idea he had one day. That could also and be it the just case. Kind of <laughs> happens to be have more potential. I thought mm, you meant the yeah. college proposals, because free college doesn't require a lot of thought to come up with either. No, no that's true. No, I, I guess you're right. Neither of them really require a lot of thought. No, that's true. Um, yeah, shall we move on to some of our other uh, ideas? Or... Yes. Right, so uh, here's yeah. one of my favorites. Uh, she wants to uh, have an expansion of affordable housing to the tune of some fucking $500 billion, which is quite a lot of money. Uh, and in this, there's also some uh, things which I like as a city planner to fight against mandatory lot size and minimum parking requirements. And for those of you unfamiliar, um, it was for the longest time and still exists today this idea that uh, density is bad for uh, individuals like physical and also their moral health. Yes, the morality must be maintained. Um, so there's been over like, I don't know, 60s, 70s, 80s, etc., there have been these rules to have certain mandatory lot sizes so that people have like enough space to live in which will be good for their health and their morality and whatnot and of course minimum parking requirements so everyone can have a car and park it everywhere which has a lot of downsides because it means you can't really have an effective public transportation system because the density goes way down and you need density to have an effective public uh, transit system and she wants to do away with these things, which I love. So good on her, and fuck you, Junan Castro, for not having done this when you were housing an urban development director. Fucking piece of shit. <clears throat> so yes, uh, that's good. Um, what else? Oh, uh, here's one which I also really liked. Um, she wants to have like this flat tax on ultra millionaires of like one percent. Uh, but if they want to leave the country, they have to pay a 40% exit tax, which uh, I kind of like. It'd be nice to be more, but 40% is good. I like 40. 60 would be better. 80 would be very nice. 
How about 90? How about 90? Come on. Meet me halfway. Let's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> I do like the idea of an exit tax that big. That's, you know, you want to leave and, you know, North contribute because there's like a fucking tiny tax of 1%? Go fuck yourself. We're going to take 40% of your shit now. Yeah. I like that. But, uh... Yeah. As for some of the bad stuff, uh, I mean, like, the domestic policy stuff is generally, like, fine social democratic shit. It's like, yeah, I don't really have much to complain about here, to be honest. It's social democracy. Um, could be better, could be a lot better, but, you know, compared to what there is, it's <clears throat> quite a step up. And uh, where, where I've most of my problems with uh, Warren is her foreign policy record, which is a lot more mixed. It's not the worst, but it could be a lot better. Before we move on to that, just really quickly, remember, not to be overly cynical, but remember when presidential candidates promise very specific numbers of money to go to a certain project, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Uh, Trump promised that he would spend $2 trillion on the US infrastructure and is yet to spend any money off of it. And a few months ago, he went out and said, yeah, no, I was never going to do that. It's just talking points when they say very specific high numbers. They're never going to be able to finance it. And also, it's just a pipe dream. Yeah, in mm. many ways, you're probably right. But uh, one can Speaking dream. Of one can pipe dream. dream. How about that Keystone pipeline? <laughs> <laughs> it is beautiful. And the reason, the reason I say it's a pipe dream, right, is <laughs> because it's a... It's, uh, uh, even the Democrats wanted it. The Democrats were totally game to do the infrastructure thing. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but even with complete Democratic support and the Republican Party behind him, he didn't do it. He didn't do it, folks. So Warren's going to try to do this huge investment thing without the support of the Republicans and only kind of support from the Democrats. It's not so. So just be wary. Don't support Warren because of that one proposal. Yeah, no, mm. that's true. Like, all these proposals can die if, like, you know. They don't even if they don't get a majority in both uh, houses, that's not going to happen. And even then, like a bunch of these and Democrats are shit. <laughs> keep that in mind mm. as well. So, they would have to fight tooth and nail to keep Congress. They're yeah. never going to get Senate. They're never going to get the Senate back. Yeah, they can so, forget all about the Senate. A lot of this stuff probably not going to happen, but uh, you know, it's, uh, we'll see. I mean, that that's true for all candidates. Yeah, I it's not specifically against Warren. All mind. of them are going to, you know. Yeah, yeah, but especially Warren is promising a lot of stuff that um, you can just tell logically wouldn't happen. Most mm. likely, yeah. But uh, yeah, her foreign policy, um, like I said, pretty mixed. Like it's not the worst, but it's also could be a hell of a lot better. So some good things she did support uh, ending U.S. involvement in. Uh, the Yemen war. Um, I think she co-sponsored a thing which says that the US will not do a first strike thing in terms of uh, nuclear weapons. Um, mm. She's also opposed like arms deals with Saudi Arabia, so uh, some good stuff. And she also voted against uh, uh, army and training Syrian rebels in 2014. So that, that's good. Uh, but some of the bad stuff, she's supported sanctions on Venezuela. Uh, also won't co-sponsor a resolution which would prohibit funding uh, armed forces in Venezuela. So, you know, possible coup, who knows? Might be down. Um, she's also criticized Trump for being possibly too soft on North Korea, because, you know, he had the peace talk summit, whatever it was, with uh, Kim. Yeah. Uh, in 2014, uh, fucking Israel uh, decided to bomb uh, Gaza, including some uh, schools there, which she supported, and has condemned the UN multiple times over uh, having an anti-Israel bias. Uh, she won't condemn Israeli settlements there. So, uh, mm. and also has voted to increase uh, like foreign aid to Israel and their military projects. So, uh, mm. there's some of the bad shit. And uh, while she does support the Iran nuclear deal, she also wants to put more sanctions against Iran. Because that makes sense. That doesn't contradict each other at all. So, but she also uh, sp co-sponsored a bill which would prohibit um, going to war against Iran without uh, what, uh, 
Let me rephrase it. She co-sponsored a bill which would prohibit military operations against Iran without congressional approval. Which I mm. imagine Congress will be down with going to war with Iran anyway, but, you know, it's a different matter. Um, and there's the last thing which I think shows some of the limits of social democracy. Um, she's, uh, for once to somehow turn the uh, US military green and carbon neutral, but without giving up, like, the 800 military bases around the world and maintaining, like, US global imperial hegemony, whatever you want to call it. Which is... The uh, military is a renewable uh, energy. <laughs> yeah, she somehow wants to turn, like, the military empire green, which is fucking... How? How? The, the, that's Buy a degradable bullets. <laughs> Yeah. Green it's... imperialism. Yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> it's ridiculous. That's the most social democratic thing I can think of. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's also has like a post military budget, particularly in her state, because you know fucking economy, jobs, even when no uh, also defend the use of like completely outdated and useless equipment. And I, I know like so I know soldiers in the military who have worked on that particular equipment. It's shit. It's like 30 years old, and it's garbage. Like, you can't do anything mm. with it anymore. But it's still being produced because, you know, there's fucking, uh, there's jobs in it, and she doesn't want to give those up. Because they're in her state. So, yeah. <laughs> there's uh, the downsides of your social democracy. Still kind of imperialist. Yeah, some would argue more imperialist. Yeah. Well, that's basically uh, the... But there's a lot more of uh, this before, and also, I do want to know, because this is like the third thing we've done now on these candidates looking into them, and it was very refreshing reading Elizabeth Warren's things, because a lot of these things is actually clear that someone has sat down and thought about this, it's not just a line somewhere like, I support the economy, or <laughs> a fair and balanced budget, I think it was fucking Julian Castro who supported a balanced budget, what the fuck that means, I don't know. But there's actually, like, thought-out things here. There's actually numbers and, you know, we're going to tax these people this much percent, it's going to give this much money, yada yada. There's actually someone who's sat down and thought about this. It's not just... Which was very refreshing. It's, uh, <laughs> most of the people we've looked into, yeah, they've decided to run before having anything, like, prepared for running. Uh, it was refreshing having someone who's actually, I don't know, looked into shit. Yeah. So yeah, that's uh, that's Warren. Uh, good social democrats, still an imperialist, kind of mere communicator. Man, any anything else to add? No, no. She's a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that that summarizes it pretty well. Pocahontas. <laughs> Jesus. The, um, she just rem she reminds me too much of Hillary Clinton. It makes me uncomfortable. Yeah, I, wouldn't, yeah. I don't know. Clinton was way worse, but yeah, but she supported Clinton though. Oh well, yeah, but I mean, I think she was neutral during the primaries. Mm, no, I she think was neutral during the no, primaries. She was a pretty early supporter. I don't. Know. Did she? Yeah. Uh, yeah. There was some controversy about that. Hmm. It kind of messed over Bernie's campaign. Hmm. Right. Yeah. Well. I guess we could get into the Trump controversy about her ethnicity. We could get into how she screwed over the system and benefited off of it by falsely claiming she was Native American, and that turned into something very embarrassing. But I don't want to talk about Elizabeth Warren anymore. That's yeah, fair. that's not. Yeah. There's a lot more here, but there's just... Pff, there's too much here to talk about. Uh, to cheer us up, yeah. I thought I would read an email that we received from a oh. fan from... Uh, Australia. We have fans. Nice. So, um, the the headline is "Glad I found your show," and the message reads: Aww. "Thanks, shit islanders. My shit island is Australia, Melbourne, but I was born in the shit British islands. Uh, great hmm. to get Marxist and Nordic perspective. Your show is a necessary counter to Nordic Frontier podcast, which is a Nazi podcast." Uh, your English language oh, style and vocabulary is great, as most Scandinavians seem to be. 
It's almost as though England was occupied by Norwegians and Danes for hundreds of years. But we don't talk about that because of the process moments. <laughs> Sincerely, Anthony McKee. I, I guess I'm also a Nordic now. Yeah, sure. Okay, fine, I can live with that. Thanks, Andy. Oh, Anthony. Giving us compliments. Yeah, thank you for the pep talk, Andy. Anthony. We do appreciate it. Anthony. <laughs> Sorry, Andy. <laughs> thank you for the email. Uh, if you want to send us an email, you can send it to shitislandshow at gmail.com. And we might read yes, it, or, or we might not. We might if not, we need to be cheered up. <laughs> also, if you're a sponsor and, you know, like, you know, Exxon, maybe, I don't know, uh, Monsanto, you know. Yeah. We can use money. We have a show, you know, saying, plug, plug, <laughs> hints, hints. Yeah, sure. For those of you unfamiliar with the show, Jules is kidding. <laughs> <laughs> kinda. Kinda. All right, uh, should we move on to the man yeah, of the Yeah, let's hour? move on. <laughs> Joseph Biden. Yeah! The man the myth, least the legend. favorite creepy Uncle Joe. Biden man, action man. Yeah, oh my god. <laughs> this has been the assignment of my life. I mean, there's so much to cover with this guy. Joseph Biden. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I've heard he's I guess. not great. No, Peter, I if mean, I understand it correctly, he has a great uh, track record. He's always been a very good person. Yeah, I've heard from Joe Biden particularly that mm. he's been involved in um, like civil rights his entire life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In mm-hmm. one way or another. <laughs> On one side <laughs> you or could another. Say, you could say he's been great at reading what side of history to be on his entire career. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, that's Biden. It's like he's known which was the right call and which was the wrong call his whole career and kind of said, ah, I'm going to go 50-50 on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, he is undisputedly, if you look at the polls, he is the front runner of this race. Uh, some polls suggest that he leads by as much as three to one over Bernie or, uh, I guess, Warren, who's number two. Where do you start on a guy like Joe Biden? He's been in politics for 500 years and um, all of it in America, even before America was a country, Joe Biden was in some, in some civil sense involved with the politics of the nation. I believe he started in, uh, an, in a Native American tribe where he was uh, the spokesperson of their interests to the poachers who came to the area Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, used his leverage as someone who grew up saying, I like the railroads to connect with the common (laughs) uh, Native American Uh, and uh, has been in politics ever since. No, but seriously, this guy has been in politics for the longest time. If you wanted, if you want a comprehensive coverage of his entire career, this, this podcast would take three hours, five hours. Five. <laughs> yeah yeah no i'm not there's so much stuff he's been involved in i'm gonna just run through some of the stuff that stuck out to me really quickly as memorable in terms of who joe biden is as a character and as a person uh just kind of in bullet point form mm. and i'm gonna call chapter one delaware democrat okay chapter one we should have some <laughs> okay. some music uh, <laughs> some music playing underneath that goes like dun 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 chapter one delaware democrat What does Delaware Democrat mean? Well, it's a very specific label. Like you had something called the Dixiecrats in mm-hmm. from the South until the 1970s, which are these people who uh, are Democrats economically and I guess in some sense also socially, but then deviate on some very key issues. Like the Dixiecrats were very against desegregation, for instance, um, and were very influential in keeping segregation around until way too recently because they just held so much power then ronald reagan came around uh i guess and nixon too and changed the way they campaigned in the south to appeal to the dixiecrats so since then all of the people who didn't want to desegregate have pretty much voted for the republican party instead of the democratic party so the dixiecrats aren't around anymore but bringing it back to delaware democrats delaware democrats are very much still around and joe biden has been the stock photo man of the Delaware Democrats since the, the from, most say, Delawarean 70s. of all the Delawareans. Yeah, how do you describe a Delaware Democrat? Well, a Delaware Democrat is very pro business. 
to right. such a degree that most Republicans would be envious of just how pro-business he is. <laughs> he has, in many instances, most instances, when there's been some kind of vote, sided with big corporations. Uh, when it came to when it's come to economic downturns, when it comes to proposals on how to help people struggling, he has pretty consistently voted for big business. He has. Um, done some very draconian stuff uh, economically, including the, um, the thing that motivated uh, Elizabeth Warren to get into politics, the uh, Bankruptcy Abuse Act. Uh, it's called the Prevention and Consumer Protection Act, which uh, weakened bankruptcy protections, protections for consumers. Uh, he was very instrumental in getting it, uh, in get, in getting it passed. So much so that when it failed the first three times it was around, he kept upping it to a vote until it was passed on the fourth time they voted on it. And he's also been, in, in that same vein, he's been very instrumental in gutting welfare programs, especially in the 90s, where he, uh, was, where he sponsored and wrote legislation which weakened uh, who could get welfare. And for how long? He, he wrote the section on how long families could get welfare. So uh, the time limits on how long you can get welfare as a family uh, if you're unemployed or aren't getting enough money from your job to uh, sustain your family. You can thank Joe Biden for that. <laughs> uh, he has actually targeting families uh, economically has been one of his fortes. And that's, again, a, a, a very key thing to uh, chapter one. Uh, this is the kind of the climax of chapter one. Uh, targeting <laughs> families economically has kind of been his forte. He, his legislation alone has led to a 75% reduction of those who were eligible to get, of the families who were eligible to get welfare before 1996 to today. So that means that uh, roughly... Uh, some stats say 20 million, some stats say 40 million uh, uh, people are in families which are poor and uneligible to get some kind of assistance. And that's largely in due to the Delaware Democrat influence and Joe Biden himself. So that's the thing. <clears throat> what should we call the next point? I guess chapter two could be called crime or like tough on crime. So ding, ding, ding. Chapter two, tough on crime. Uh, so you sound in pain. Yeah, I am. I can't wait to be done talking about Democrats, to be honest. <laughs> in the 90s, Joe Biden uh, wrote and sponsored all of Bill Clinton's crime bills, which I mean, there's been written very long books about how awful Bill Clinton has been for the United States, especially on crime, where they wrote specific crime bills which incentivized states to incarcerate more people and pass what's called truth and sentencing laws, which make it virtually impossible for criminals to get out before their sentence is over if they fit certain criteria, such as they had drugs on them, they were or black. they passed state lines, or yeah, any, and, and they keep adding new provisions to those truth and sentencing laws, which disproportionately uh, target minorities and people who um, you know, are not as privileged or don't know the right people. So that's the thing. Um, another thing is he's a very big fan of the war on drugs. He's, he's, since he was first elected, he's talked very warmly about warring drugs, I guess, <laughs> and uh, being uh, very anti-drug and pushing for higher sentences for people who have drugs on them, people who take drugs, and people who really just need help, but instead are put in prisons and turned into free labor, which, you know, this also leads me into chapter three called Massive Racist. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> chapter three, Giant Asshole Racist. Like we said earlier, Brian has been involved in civil rights in one way or another for his entire life. Yeah, he has, and let's just say he's not been on the right side of history. <laughs> no. Okay, so 
one of the first things that got him into the national uh, um, limelight, if you want to call it that, was how he, in the 70s, all throughout the 70s, tried to limit segregation bus, uh, desegregation in busing. Uh, and what that means is, you can look it up, it's a, it's a whole concept called uh, desegregation busing. So, like I said, the Dixiecrats were a very big thing in uh, the American uh, Democratic Party, and they pushed for uh, the, the Democrats and the establishment in general not doing anything about desegregation. So until the 1980s, uh, a lot of school buses were segregated. So what that meant was there were buses for white kids and buses for black kids and buses for Mexican kids in a lot of areas in the U.S. And this led to uh, a lot of segregation in education in America. And Joe Biden was totally cool with that. In fact, he tried to pass legislation saying that the government couldn't decide if uh, states wanted to desegregate their buses. Uh, he lost that battle but has been very vague about whether or not he thought, you know, he was wrong. And every time someone brings it up, he changes the subject. He was a very good friend of uh, an awful, awful person that l luckily died a long time ago called Strom Thurmond, who was um, just the worst and has done, ev and since he got into politics, did everything he could to limit the effects of civil rights and uh, integration in the United States as both a senator and someone in local politics. He was also a very fanatical Christian who um, let some of the satanic panic stuff in the 80s where uh, uh, a lot of people believed that young kids were becoming rebellious because of Satanism and rock and roll and heavy metal. God, I can't wait to be done with this politics stuff. Uh, or this, this, this American politics stuff more. more uh, no, this uh, politics so, in general. Fuck politics. It's so depressing. Okay, the final chapter. I'm just going to jump to it. Chapter, what is it, four or five? Chapter... Seven. Yeah, chapter, the, the last chapter is uh, dun, 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 corrupt, dun, dun. corrupt and Proud. Dun, dun, dun. Chapter whatever. Corrupt and Proud. He is one of the most immoral people to run for president uh, ever, who is the most corrupt. He has accepted money from Goldman Sachs, big Wall Street companies. He, uh, uh, like he, he, he's, he's received money from pretty much every right-wing organization you could imagine. And because of that, he still defends all of the policies which even Hillary Clinton has had to run away from from the 90s, uh, both the truth and sentencing stuff, uh, but also bankruptcy protections. Right after the big Wall Street crash in 2008, he meddled with the bailout provisions so that the middle class would have to pay for all the money they gave to the big banks and, not the, and, and made sure that it wasn't a loan, but was actually just money given out. Uh, in, in most countries uh, who gave out bailouts, there was a provision that the money they gave out would have to be paid back eventually once the banks got a surplus again. Not the case in America. In America, the middle class had to pay for it, despite a giant surge in unemployment, a giant surge in um, uh, house prices going down and uh, uh, wages dropping. He made sure that if, okay, if you're a, uh, someone who's not a rich American, but live in America listening, you paid for that bailout. And that's why things are bad in America right now. So he's a big reason why America has yet to recover as much from the 2008 financial crisis as most of Europe and other countries. I think that's my final chapter on him. I guess if, if you want to sum him up, he's kind of known for being this folksy kind of guy and he's he has a reputation for being hard to predict the people who work for him say that they they have a hard time writing scripts for him because you will often just deviate and just go on long unwinding tangents about trains or about uh, i don't know like his childhood or about people he remember from his past so he's kind of impossible to work for as in any official capacity uh he has he loves the military is an addendum he has spent a lot of his time 
working for the federal government, uh, passing earmarks and legislation so that they could get more military bases in Delaware, uh, most notably the Dover Air Force Base and the Newcastle Air National Guard Base, which are giant um, military facilities that take up a lot of space in Delaware, which could be used for more productive stuff like, I don't know, giant sand dunes or uh, (laughs) uh, like pits. Literally just anything else. Literally everything else, yeah. So that's my monologue, I guess, about the man known as Joe Biden, who's the front runner of this race, because we can't have nice things. <laughs> and I guess uh, to uh, to conclude, uh, I think we should say uh, vote Biden. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean that's the seems... best chance we have against Trump. That will be his first priority as president: defeating <laughs> Trump. <beating> Trump. <laughs> Yeah. Once I de- defeat Trump, I'm going to defeat Trump. So, he's going he's gonna to defeat you, him Biden. so hard, he's going to defeat him twice. Yeah, and I mean, it's fair that people focus on how gross he is, because he is gross. Mm. And he looks like a sad puppy, but he's also just a monster. He is. Yeah. All right. Well, do we have anything else to add here? I don't... Yeah, he's horrible. Um, he's a terrible Do, do you reckon he'll stay in first place? I don't think he will. I have a sneaking suspicion he's gonna... It. I think, okay, so these polls don't really mean anything. It's most of, of the nomination process is based on momentum. Mm. So if, if no matter who wins, I think the person that's gonna win is the person who wins the first couple of states in the nomination process because that's historically how it's been. When, once you win something, you're more likely to win something else. Like yeah. when Bill Clinton was or became the nominee of the Democrats in the 1992 election, he was polling very, very low numbers until he started winning the first couple of states. And he was a giant surprise to everyone. I don't know. Like, I guess it depends on who votes, like who votes in the election. If a lot of young people register to vote in the nomination process, could be that Bernie wins and then gets the momentum. But I think if if we don't see more people getting involved in the Democratic Party and just the people who are in the Democratic Party right now vote, I think Biden is the probable nominee. That's a depressing thought. Because the people who actually vote, as is the case in every Western society with democracy, old people just vote. They don't have anything else to do. What are they going to do? Go to see a movie? Go (laughs) to a spa? Like, what are they going to do? They're they're just mooching off society. Fucking yeah, they just leeches. sit around all day and like look at stuff and wait till like something happens, and then there's an election. And like, oh, we're gonna go vote. Like that's how old people like. And I t- when I say old, I mean like people who 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 are retired. retired, who have been retired for maybe fifteen years, who have just run out of stuff to do, which is interesting. Those are the people who always vote. That's how Trump was elected. Like they just always vote, and they're scared of everything, and they don't have anything to lose. So. <laughs> Yeah, they remember the good old days, which Joe Biden's uh, longs for. You know, the good old yeah, days. Hints, hints, older, hints. The older you get, the more afraid of change you get. So mm-hmm. if you vote for Biden, he's just going to keep things the same. He's going to make them a lot worse for most people, but you're not most people. You're an old person who's going to die in two years anyway. That's a good point. So, young people in America listening, if you don't want to see Joe Biden be the nominee, join the Democratic Party as a joke and vote for literally any other candidate in the nomination process and then leave the Democratic Party again if you don't like it. Just if you, if you really hate Biden, Biden as much fucking... as you say you do. <laughs> yeah, if you really hate Biden as much as you, sh- you say you do and you are eligible to register in the nomination process, do it. Why not? What do you have to lose? Like, Your just dignity. do it. I mean, yeah, you have to call yourself a, a Democrat for a while, but, uh, you yeah, just but imagine the anyone. dignity you'll have if fucking Biden is, you know, your nominee or the president even. Yeesh. You'd also have to hang out with Democrats for a few hours, which is excruciating. Ah, uh, mm. just like bash them over the head with dust cup, it's all. It'll be fine. Yeah. Or the bread book, if you're into that instead. I haven't read it, but I've heard it's good. Yeah. It would be pretty funny to see Biden and Trump in debates, though. I will give them that. That would be so depressing. I am mortified by that possibility. Trump, Trump but would yes. win, probably. I yeah, he know. would. Like, I think. Yeah, Biden looks so sad, like, and 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 he's so droopy and old. Yeah. 
Yeah, basically. Biden doesn't really have anything good really to argue for. It's just like, I'm not Trump, okay? Yeah. Cool. And half of the time, all he, sees, he does is talk about how spoiled young people are. Yeah, he nice. does. <sighs> Girls, I hope You want free win. college? What's next? Free gumdrops. <laughs> yeah, he said uh, a lot of bad stuff. Uh, shall, shall we move on to someone who's a bit more likable? Uh, yes, sure. Yeah, yeah, why not? <laughs> Thank you. Um, Bernard well, Sanders. Yeah, it's the person you've all been waiting for for these last four episodes or whatever it's been. Yeah. <laughs> and this one. <laughs> Finally, at the very, very end. I might be disappointing you a bit because I am going to bring up some, uh, some less good things about oh, Bernard. Oh, that's important too. Um, so he's, he's not perfect. I think it's important to remember that. That is very uh, true. He Bernard Sanders was born in Brooklyn, New York. In 1941, making him 77 years old as of the time of recording this episode. And if he were to win the presidency uh, in, in 2020, in 2021, he would be taking office at the age of 79, making him the oldest president in American history, nine years older than Trump, who is the current record holder for oldest president. Uh, mm. Everyone knows about Bernie Sanders. He has a very long record of activism, left-wing activism and peace activism. Uh, he's fought for abortion rights and L the LGBT community. Uh, decades. He has also been involved since for his like, entire life in civil rights, but this time, like, good, unlike yeah, some exactly. people. <laughs> um, when Joe Biden was cursing up with uh, segregationists, uh, Bernie Sanders was protesting him. And was getting arrested, <laughs> like, fighting against segregation. Yeah. Uh, he attended the, the 1963 March on Washington, uh, where uh, Martin Luther King Jr. gave his I Have a Dream speech, written by Cory Booker. <laughs> and, uh, that, yeah, that's pretty much that. He ran for mayor in Burlington later, in 1980. Um... And he was mayor for eight years. He was re-elected three times, defeating both Democrats and Republicans because he was independent, or he was third party, I think. He was a member of some other party. I can't remember what it was called. But he, I think Jules can uh, can attest to... Uh, he has a pretty good record when it comes to Burlington. Yeah. yeah um, that's uh, my favorite mayor in the race. Even better than Buttigieg? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, somehow. It's weird. Somehow. Despite not being gay. So, uh, under Sanders, <laughs> Burlington became the first city in the country to fund community trust housing, which is a, uh, for, those, for those who don't know, it's a non-profit corporation that develops and stewards affordable housing uh, on, on, on behalf of the people, of the community, basically. So, that's pretty cool. That he was the first to ever do that. Uh, he led downtown, uh, extensive downtown revitalization process. Wasn't Burlington also one of the first places which had like LGBT uh, protections? I didn't see any of that. Uh, oh. but, I remember I mean, reading he, about that like years ago. So I, I know he tired. has been <laughs> in like pride parades and, and, and fought for. I don't know about Burlington specifically. Hmm. He's been a critic of uh, U.S. foreign policy in Latin America. He became the first independent candidate to be elected to Congress since uh, 1950. He was a criti critic of the Patriot Act. He was against the bank bailout to 2008. Although, okay, so getting into some of the less good things. So, Sanders, while Sanders voted against the resolution authorizing the use of force in Iraq in 1991 and 2002, and he opposed the 2003 invasion of Iraq, he did, however, vote in 2001 for a controversial act called the Authorization for Use of Military Force Against Terrorists, or AUMF, which authorizes the use of United States Armed Forces against those responsible for the attacks on September 11th, 2001, and, quote, any associated forces. The, author the authorization granted the president the authority to use all, quote, necessary and appropriate force against those who he deemed quote, planned, authorized, committed, or aided the September 11th attacks, or who harbored said persons or groups. Now, there was only one 
representative who voted against this act, which was Barbara Lee, uh, who's still a representative from the California 13th uh, District. She criticized it for being a blank check, giving the government unlimited powers to wage war without debate. Uh, and she's tried to repeal it, but it hasn't yet. Classic Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Business Insider has reported that the AUMF has been used to allow military actions in Afghanistan, Philippines, Georgia, Yemen, Djibouti, Kenya, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Iraq, and Somalia. Wait, what the fuck does the Philippines have to do with 9-11? No idea. Okay, then. Uh, in 1996, Sanders voted against a bill that would have prohibited the police from purchasing tanks and armored carriers, which was it weird. Could. Uh, wait, hang on. He voted wait. against it. Wait, against? Yeah. What? <laughs> he, he voted against a bill that would have prohibited the police from purchasing tanks and armored carriers. I don't know why. Well, what? Well, why? Would he, has, the... he has a very interesting record on weapons yeah. in general and guns, because he is from Vermont. We should stress that again vermont is a very open carry pro-gun state so mm. my guess is he has voted in a lot of cases very strategically to not limit gun ownership or gun uh like uh restrictions mm. and that also sometimes translates into some more wacky stuff such as tanks yeah mm. <laughs> freedom to own tanks oh yeah uh so he became a senator for the state of Vermont in 2007. He ran for Democratic nominee in 2016. Probably uh, how most of you know the guy. Yeah. In 2017, he introduced a bill that would raise the minimum wage for federal contract workers to $15 an hour, which is also a pretty well-known bill. Uh, he introduced Workplace Democracy Act, the bill that would expand labor rights by making it easier for workers to join a union, ban right to work laws, and some anti-union provision of the Taft Hartley Act and outlaw some union busting tactics, which was endorsed by several Democratic senators, including Elizabeth Warren. E. Uh, in 2018, he introduced the Stop Bezos Act, uh, partnered with Ro Khanna, which would require large corporations to pay for food stamps and Medicaid benefits uh, their employees receive, rather than shifting the burden onto taxpayers. Which brings us to his 2020 presidential campaign. He focuses on universal health care, uh, universal and single-payer health care, paid parental leave, tuition fee, college. He's pro-labor rights and emphasizes reversing economic inequality to limit the power of the wealthy. He views global warming as a serious problem and thus supports the Green New Deal. He supports reducing military spending, pursuing diplomacy and international cooperation instead of war. Normalizing relations with Cuba and ending the travel ban to Cuba. Uh, he wants immigration reform, abortion rights, LGBT equality, recognition of Black Lives Matter concerns, and he is opposed to the death penalty. His record on Israel is pretty bad. Yep. Uh, he has. He's basically a soft Zionist. He believes that Israel has the right to exist as a Jewish state. Uh, basically free of Palestinians, uh, which, which he doesn't say, but kind of implied. He supports a two-state solutions, uh, so give him the Palestinians their own land. He is against the BDS movement, the, the boycotting movement of Israel, and he called it anti-Semitic um, and counterproductive. However, he voted against the Republican bill, which would make it illegal to boycott Israel, which is I think he said it was just a free speech thing, but he still doesn't agree with the BDS movement or with Palestinian nationalists who want a one-state solution. Um, yeah. Yeah, m much like Warren uh, supported a lot of the bad shit Israel's done. Yes. And um, also, I yeah, I think Perry says he also condemned the UN as being ant having an anti-Israel bias. Which yes, yeah. that was another thing he... Um, he said that the, the United Nations was uh, anti-Semitic and had a bias against Israel. I think he contacted someone working at the Israel. I don't think it was a general secretary, but some guy at the UN. And he was like, you better f fix this and stop being racist. Just Steve. Steve at the UN. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's... Uh, 
not great. At this, yeah, at this stage, you also have to point, like, think of his age. Like, he, he grew up at the time of the Nazis, too. So mm. his claim to, I guess, the Israeli stuff, I guess, if you want to be fair to him, has to also be looked through that lens. Mm. Where it's, and he is Jewish himself. Not that yeah. that's any defense against his support for a, a bad state. Mm. But it is, I mean, I think that kind of explains. I don't, my point being, I don't think he supports Israel to get money from APEC. No, I don't think so either. Um, I could be wrong, but it seems the, uh, to me that his support mostly comes from the place of the Nazis killed a lot of Jewish people. They need a place to live, yeah. kind of. The naive support. He has criticized Benjamin Netanyahu for being a far right, uh, nationalistic, bad person, basically. Um, yeah, he supports, which he is. He is uh, bad. Yeah, he supports the rights of Palestinians. Uh, I, he encouraged Netanyahu to stop continuing Israeli settlements in Palestine. He hasn't said that they should reverse the settlements, which already exist, but he has said that they shouldn't do any more. Um, and I'm sure that uh, him urging him to do that definitely made an impact on Benjamin Netanyahu's decision. Oh yeah, decisions. totally. He was like, oh shit, Bernie Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bernie said I should stop? Jeez. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, uh, and, and yeah, he, he, he supports the rights, the, the right to... Um, the right for Israel to exist, uh, quote, free of terrorism and bombings. Uh, and he also supports the right for a Palestinian state to exist. Which is, I mean, almost as far left on that issue as you can go in America. Yeah. Yeah. Which is depressingly not left at all. Yeah. But I think what's most important to remember about Bernie Sanders is that on February 20th, 2019, at 8.32 p.m., Danny DeVito tweeted, Bernie 2020. Goddamn! Well, I mean, if that's Game not great changer. endorsements, then, you know, what is? It, uh, it literally says on Bernie Sanders' Wikipedia page that he was endorsed by Danny DeVito, and that's the source it links <laughs> to. <laughs> Just a tweet with Danny DeVito saying, Bernie 2020. And, and that's more. when the Yang Gang died. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the Yang Gang lost the support of Danny DeVito, and well, that that was the end of the Yang Gang. You couldn't recover. You just you don't recover from that. You don't no. recover from losing the support of of DeVito. Yeah. Imagine if this show gets the support of Danny DeVito. <laughs> Shit, I don't know. Swimming. <laughs> yes, we should t t all all our listeners tweet this show at Danny DeVito. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Danny, support Shit Island. <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> so that's pretty much all I had to say about Bernie. He's he's a social democrat. He calls himself a democratic socialist, but he isn't. He's a social democrat. Mm. Uh, I I don't even. Some people say like, oh, I think he's like personally or privately a democratic socialist, but when he's running for president, he's just a social democrat. No, I think he's genuinely a social democrat, both in public and in private. Um, He's just hiding his power level. He's secretly a Soviet. Yeah. <laughs> well, he did have his honeymoon there, or whatever the fucking thing was. No, he just went there once, I think. Hey, his honeymoon. I don't know. Or whatever the fucking talking point is there. Mm. He, uh, during the last debate, I think it was, uh, he talked about uh, the war, how the war with Iran would be bad, and how the US should start pulling back troops from around the world, uh, lowering the military budget, uh, using diplomacy instead of war and drones, uh, and basically talking to nations. Um, the moderator is trying to, like, do a gotcha on him because they said, um, they basically said, like, uh, in, in 2016, you said that America should uh, open peace talks with North Korea. Now that Donald Trump is doing that, uh, are you uh, want to go back on that statement, or do you want to stand for the same thing that Donald Trump stands for? And he was like, "Well, I'm not a liar like Trump is, I and mean, I'm going to stand with what I said," uh, which was uh, respectable of him to not back down just because Trump was doing it. Yeah, what a traitor! 
Yeah. <laughs> Hashtag the resistance. Resist <laughs> everything Trump does, regardless of how good or bad it is. Just resist it all, people. Yeah. Trump is yeah, drinking so. water and breathing air. Are Democrats going to stop doing that? Or are they going to stand <laughs> with the president? Yeah, uh, it's such a stupid fucking thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, peace with North Korea is good, actually. Yes. Uh, peace yes, in general. That, that I good. mean, if it's a Trump peace, it's a bad peace. <laughs> That's so true. Because it's Trump peace. We should have, we should have a, a war with North Korea until we elect a Democrat and then we should have peace. Yeah, because ah, like, yes. there's a difference between liberal peace and conservative peace. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's ridiculous. I do like, it, 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 fucking he'd be criticized if he went to war. He'd be criticized if he like made peace. Like no matter what, he'd be criticized. It's very yeah. stupid. Yeah. As we're clear, we don't like Trump. We hate the guy. It's just for the record, not a fan. Mm. But let's not fucking be Speak ridiculous in criticisms here. <laughs> We're split itself. on this issue internally in <laughs> Shit Island. But, uh... Apparently. <laughs> no. Yeah, no. I mean, Bernie Sanders is the, the furthest left candidate yeah. in the race. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. Um... Apparently, some people were having doubts about whether Warren or Bernie were further to the left. It's definitely Bernie. Yeah, that's yeah, that's, that's dumb. Yeah. yeah, no. Um, yeah, no. Bernie's definitely more left wing and sincere in his in his left winginess. Yeah, and um, he's been then, left wing basically his entire life. Yeah. yeah, he's not gonna stop being Bernie if he's elected. Yeah, no, probably not. He he might be completely hampered by the system, but he's still gonna be little curmudgeon-y Bernie. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's that's the Bernie we like. This old curmudgeon Bernie. Yeah, yeah. True hero of us young people. <laughs> it's the, the he's just a young the, candidate this time. Yeah, he's like the, uh, the the political idol of the Zuma generation. Yes, Zoomers, come on. <laughs> Where are my Zoomer fans in the audience? Come on, raise your hands. I can't see them, but raise them anyway. This isn't even live. <laughs> I know, but raise them anyway. I have a question. Yeah. No. Can we make a promise internally in Shit Island that we won't talk any more about Democrats or Republicans but until this is an actual election? I'm not sure we can do that. No. See, I don't want to do any if, more debates. If Bernie Sanders comes out as a Marxist Leninist and announces mm -hmm. Mike Ravel as his running mate, we have to make another primary video. Okay, I'm I'm game mm -hmm. for that. In that case. Which it will, yeah. by the way, that will happen. I have no doubt in my mind that that will happen. Uh, but until I'd be down then, for like doing another like live stream of one of these debates or just me and the guy doing that, but I don't I wouldn't want to do another one of these episodes now. <laughs> yeah. It's uh it's been torture, people. The things we go through to entertain <laughs> you people. And if you want to reward our torture, please, Patreon, click the link. Click it. Thank you. I feel like we're I, I if I was a listener, I would stop paying for this show because of how much we've talked about American politics. <laughs> oh, that, that'd be fair, yes. Uh, that'd be fair. Hmm. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Well, that, that listener will be pleased to know that we will be taking a break from the primary. The Shit Island podcast is made possible by the donations from these lovely patrons. Our Tier 1 patrons, Jedi Davian, Michael Rook, Emil Segerbeck, Kvagram, Inga Leonora, Srijith, and Gecko Bite. And our cool patrons, Nyin Chan Min and M Lim. And our big boy patrons, Joshua Cheeseman, Joe Manchukwo, Michael Compton, and As Koala as Possible. Thank you for your support. If you want to be a patron and have your name read on this podcast or in my youtube videos then you can go to patreon.com forward slash asher scapegoat thank you for listening to this episode of shit island and we will see you in the next one shall we still be slaves and work for wages it is outrageous has been for ages oh this earth by right belongs to toilers and not to spoilers of liberty the master class is small, but they have lots of gall. 
When we unite to gain our right, if they resist, we'll use our might. There is no middle ground. This fight must be one round. To victory for liberty, our class is marching on. Shall we still be slaves and work for wages?